Section 6 of Trips to the Moon This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ralph Snelson Trips to the Moon by Lucian of Samosata Translated by Thomas Franklin Section 6 Icaro Menippus A Dialogue this dialogue, which is also called by the commentators Above the Clouds, has a great deal of easy wit and humor in it, without the least degree of stiffness or obscurity. It is equally severe on the gods and philosophers, and paints in the warmest colors the glaring absurdity of the whole pagan system. Menippus and a Friend Three thousand stadia from the earth to the moon, my first resting place, from thence up to the sun, about five hundred parasongas, and from the sun to the highest heaven, and the palace of Jupiter, as far as a swift eagle could fly in a day. What are you muttering to yourself, Menippus, talking about the stars and pretending to measure distances? As I walk behind you I hear of nothing but suns and moons, parasongas, stations, and I know not what. Marvel not, my friend, if I utter things aerial and sublime, for I am recounting the wonders of my late journey. What? Tracing your road by the stars, as the Phoenicians do? Not so, by Jove. I have been amongst the stars themselves. You must have had a long dream indeed to travel so many leagues in it. It is no dream, I assure you. I am just arrived from Jupiter. How say you? Menippus let down from heaven? Even so, this moment come from thence, where I have seen and heard things most strange and miraculous. If you doubt the truth of them, the happier shall I be to have seen what is past belief. How is it possible, most heavenly and divine Menippus, that a mere mortal like me should dispute the veracity of one who has been carried above the clouds, one to speak in the language of Homer, of the inhabitants of heaven. But inform me, I beseech you, which way you got up, and how you procured so many ladders, for by your appearance I should not take you for another Phrygian boy to be carried up by an eagle and made a cup-bearer of. You are an old scoffer, I know and therefore I am not surprised that an account of things above the comprehensions of the vulgar should appear like a fable to you. But let me tell you I wanted no ladders, nor an eagle's beak to transport me thither, for I had wings of my own. This was beyond Daedalus himself to be metamorphosed thus into a hawk or jay, and we know nothing of it. You are not far from the mark, my friend, for my wings were a kind of Dedalian contrivance. Thou art a bold rogue indeed, and meant no doubt if you had chanced to fall into any part of the ocean to have called it, as Icarus did, by your own name, and styled it the Menippian Sea. Not so. His wings were glued on with wax, and when the sun melted it could not escape falling, but mine had no wax in them. Indeed! Now shall I quickly know the truth of this affair? You shall. I took, you must know, a very large eagle, and a vulture also, one of the strongest I could get, and cut off their wings. But if you have leisure, I will tell you the whole expedition from beginning to end. Pray do, for I long to hear it. By Jove the friendly, I entreat thee, keep me no longer in suspense, for I am hung by the ears. Listen, then, for I would by no means balk an inquisitive friend, especially one who is nailed by the ears as you are. Finding on a close examination that everything here below, such as riches, honors, empire, and dominion, were all ridiculous and absurd, of no real value or estimation, considering them with all as so many obstacles to the study of things more worthy of contemplation, I looked up toward nobler objects and meditated on the great universe before me, 
Doubts immediately arose concerning what philosophers call the world, nor could I discover how it came into existence, its creator, the beginning or the end of it. When I descended to its several parts, I was still more in the dark. I beheld the stars scattered, as it were, by the hand of chance over the heavens. I saw the sun and wished to know what it was. Above all, the nature of the moon appeared to me most wonderful and extraordinary. The diversity of its forms pointed out some hidden cause which I could not account for. The lightning also which pierces through everything, the impetuous thunder, the rain, hail, and snow, all raised my admiration, and seemed inexplicable to human reason. In this situation of mind, the best thing I thought which I could possibly do was to consult the philosophers. They, I made no doubt, were acquainted with the truth, and could impart it to me. Selecting, therefore, the best of them, as well as I could judge from the paleness and severity of their countenances and the length of their beards, for they seemed all to be high-speaking and heavenly-minded men, into the hands of these I entirely resigned myself, and partly by ready money, partly by the promise of more, when they had made me completely wise, I engaged them to teach me the perfect knowledge of the universe, and how to talk on sublime subjects. But so far were they from removing my ignorance, that they only threw me into greater doubt and uncertainty, by puzzling me with atoms, vacuums, beginnings, ends, ideas, forms, and so forth. And the worst of all was that though none agreed with the rest in what they advanced, but were all of contrary opinions, yet did every one of them expect that I should implicitly embrace his tenets and subscribe to his doctrine. It is astonishing that such wise men should disagree, and with regard to the same things should not all be the same opinion. You will laugh, my friend, when I shall tell you of their pride and impudence in the relation of extraordinary events. To think that men who creep upon this earth, and are not a whit wiser, or can see farther than ourselves, some of them old, blind, and lazy, should pretend to know the limits and extent of heaven, measure the sun's circuit, and walk above the moon, that they should tell us the size and form of the stars, as if they were just come down from them that those who scarcely know how many furlongs it is from Athens to Megara should inform you exactly how many cubits distance the sun is from the moon, should mark out the height of the air and the depth of the sea, describe circles from squares upon triangles, make spheres, and determine the length and breadth of heaven itself. Is it not to the last degree impudent and audacious? when they talk of things thus obscure and unintelligible, not merely to offer their opinions as conjectures, but boldly to urge and insist upon them, to do everything but swear that the sun is a mass of liquid fire, that the moon is inhabited, that the stars drink water, and that the sun draws up the moisture from the sea as with a whale-rope, and distributes his draught over the whole creation, how little they agree upon any one thing, and what a variety of tenets they embrace is but too evident. For first, with regard to the world, their opinions are totally different. Some affirm that it hath neither beginning nor end. Some, whom I cannot but admire, point out to us the manner of its construction, and the maker of it, a supreme deity, whom they worship as creator of the universe but they have not told us whence he came, nor where he exists. Neither before the formation of the world can we have any idea of time or place. These are indeed bold and presumptuous diviners. But what would you say, my dear friend, were you to hear them disputing, concerning ideal and incorporeal substances, and talking about finite and infinite? for this is a principal matter of contention between them, some confining all things within certain limits, others prescribing none. 
some assert that there are many worlds and laugh at those who affirm there is but one whilst another no man of peace gravely assures us that war is the original parent of all things need i mention to you their strange opinions concerning the deities one says that number is a god others swear by dogs geese and plane trees some give the rule of everything to one god alone and take away all power from the rest a scarcity of deities which i could not well brook others more liberal increased the number of gods and gave to each his separate province and employment calling one the first and allotting to others the second or third rank of divinity some held that gods were incorporeal and without form others supposed them to have bodies it was by no means universally acknowledged that the gods took cognizance of human affairs some there were who exempted them from all care and solicitude as we exonerate our old men from business and trouble bringing them in like so many mute attendants on the stage there are some too who go beyond all this and deny that there are any gods at all but assert that the world is left without any guide or master i could not tell how to refuse my assent to these high-sounding and long-bearded gentlemen and yet could find no argument amongst them all that had not been refuted by some or other of them often was i on the point of giving credit to one when as homer says to other thoughts my heart inclined the only way therefore to put an end to all my doubts was i thought to make a bird of myself and fly up to heaven this my own eager desires represented as probable and the fable writer aesop confirmed it who carries up not only his eagles but his beetles and camels thither to make wings for myself was impossible but to fit those of a vulture and an eagle to my body might i imagined answer the same purpose i resolved therefore to try the experiment and cut off the right wing of one and the left of the other bound them on with thongs and at the extremities made loops for my hands then raising myself by degrees just skimmed above the ground like the geese when finding my project succeed i made a bold push got upon the acropolis and from thence slid down to the theatre having got so far without danger or difficulty i began to meditate greater things and setting off from parnethes or hymettus flew to gerania and from thence to the top of the tower at corinth from thence over Foloi and Dermanthus quite to Tigetus. And now, resolving to strike a bold stroke, as I was already becoming a high flyer, and perfect in my art, I no longer confined myself to chicken flights, but getting upon Olympus and taking a little light provision with me, I made the best of my way directly towards heaven the extreme height which i soared to brought on a giddiness at first but this soon went off and when i got as far as the moon having left a number of clouds behind me i found a weariness particularly in my vulture wing i halted therefore to rest myself a little and looking down from thence upon the earth like homer's jupiter beheld the places where the brave Mycians prove their martial force, and hardy Thracians tame the savage horse, then India, Persia, and all conquering Greece, which gave me wonderful pleasure and satisfaction. Let me have an exact account of all your travels. I beseech you, omit not the least particular, but give me your observations upon everything i expect to hear a great deal about the form and figure of the earth and how it all appeared to you from such an eminence and so you shall ascend therefore in imagination with me to the moon and consider the situation and appearance of the earth from thence suppose it to seem as it did to me much less than the moon insomuch that when i first looked down 
I could not find the high mountains and the great sea, and if it had not been for the Rhodian Colossus and the Tower of Pharos, should not have known where the earth stood. At length, however, by the reflection of the sunbeams, the ocean appeared and showed me the land, when, keeping my eyes fixed upon it, I beheld clearly and distinctly everything that was doing upon earth, not only whole nations and cities, but all the inhabitants of them, whether waging war, cultivating their fields, trying causes, or anything else. Their women, animals, everything, in short, was before me. Most improbable, all this, and contradictory. You told me but just before that earth was so little by its great distance that you could scarce find it, and if it had not been for the Colossus it would not have appeared at all. And now on a sudden, like another Lincius, you can spy out men, trees, animals, nay, I suppose even a flea's nest if you chose it. I thank you for putting me in mind of what I had forgot to mention. When I beheld the earth, but could not distinguish the objects upon it, on account of the immense distance, I was horribly vexed at it, and ready to cry, when on a sudden Empedocles, the philosopher, stood behind me all over ashes, as black as coal, and dreadfully scorched. When I saw him, I must own, I was frightened, and took him for some demon of the moon. But he came up to me, and cried out, Menippus, don't be afraid. I am no god. Why callst thou me divine? I am Empedocles, the naturalist. After I had leaped into the furnace, a vapor from Etna carried me up hither, and here I live in the moon and feed upon dew. I am come to free you from your present distress. You are very kind, said I, most noble Empedocles and when I fly back to Greece I shall not forget to pay my devotions to you in the tunnel of my chimney every new moon. Think not, replied he, that I do this for the sake of any reward I might expect for it. By Endymion, that is not the case, but I was really grieved to see you so uneasy, and now how shall we contrive to make you see clear? That, by Jove, said I, I cannot guess unless you can take off this mist from my eyes, for they are horribly dim at present. You have brought the remedy along with you. How so? Have you not got an eagle's wing? True, but what has that to do with an eye? An eagle, you know, is more sharp-sighted than any other creature, and the only one that can look against the sun. Your true royal bird is known by never winking at the rays, be they ever so strong. So I have heard, and I am sorry I did not, before I came up, take out my own eyes and put in the eagles. Thus imperfect to be sure, I am not royally furnished, but a kind of bastard bird. You may have one royal eye for all that, if you please. It is only when you rise up to fly, holding the vulture's wings still, and moving the eagles only, by which means you will see clearly with one, though not at all with the other. That will do, and is sufficient for me. I have often seen smiths and other artists look with one eye only to make their work the truer. This conversation ended, Empedocles vanished into smoke, and I saw no more of him. I acted as he advised me, and no sooner moved my eagle's wing than a great light came all around me, and I saw everything as clear as possible. Looking down to earth, I beheld distinctly cities and men, and everything that passed amongst them, not only what they did openly, but whatever was going on at home, and in their own houses, where they thought to conceal it. I saw Lysimachus betrayed by his son, Antiochus intriguing with his mother-in-law, Alexander the Thessalian slain by his wife, 
and Attalus poisoned by his son. In another place I saw Arsaces killing his wife, and the eunuch Arbaces drawing his sword upon Arsaces. Spartum the Mede dragged by the heels from the banquet by his guards, and knocked on the head with a cup. In the palaces of Scythia and Thrace the same wickedness was going forward, and nothing could I see but murderers, adulterers, conspirators, false swearers, men in perpetual terrors, and betrayed by their dearest friends and acquaintance. Such was the employment of kings and great men. In private houses there was something more ridiculous. There I saw her moderus, the Epicurean, forswearing himself for a thousand drachmas, Agathocles, the Stoic, quarreling with his disciples about the salary for tuition, Clinius, the orator, stealing a file out of the temple, not to mention a thousand others who were undermining walls, litigating in the forum, extorting money, or lending it upon usury a sight upon the whole of wonderful variety. It must have been very entertaining. Let us have it all I desire. I had much ado to see. To relate it to you is impossible. It was like Homer's shield. On one side were feasting and nuptials, on the other haranguing and decrees. Here a sacrifice, and there a burial, the gatti at war the Scythians travelling in their caravans, the Egyptians tilling their fields, the Phoenicians merchandising, the Cilicians robbing and plundering, the Spartans flogging their children, and the Athenians perpetually quarrelling and going to law with one another. When all this was doing at the same time, you may conceive what a strange medley this appeared to me. It was just as if a number of dancers, or rather singers, were met together, and every one was ordered to leave the chorus, and sing his own song, each striving to drown the other's voice, by bawling as loud as he could. You may imagine what kind of a concert this would make. Truly ridiculous and confused, no doubt. And yet such, my friend, are all the poor performers upon earth and of such is composed the discordant music of human life. The voice is not only dissonant and inharmonious, but the forms and habits all differing from each other, moving in various directions, and agreeing in nothing, till at length the great master of the choir drives every one of them from the stage, and tells him he is no longer wanted there. Then all are silent and no longer disturb each other with their harsh and jarring discord. But in this wide and extensive theatre, full of various shapes and forms, everything was matter of laughter and ridicule. Above all, I could not help smiling at those who quarrel about the boundaries of their little territory, and fancy themselves great because they occupy a Sisonian field, or possess that part of Marathon which borders on Oanoa, or are masters of a thousand acres in Acarna. When after all to me who looked from above, Greece was but four fingers in breadth, and Attica a very small portion of it indeed. I could not but think how little these rich men had to be proud of. He who was lord of the most extensive country owned a spot that appeared to me about as large as one of Epicurus's atoms. When I looked down upon Peloponnesus and beheld Cenuria, I reflected with astonishment on the number of Argives and Lacedaemonians who fell in one day fighting for a piece of land no bigger than an Egyptian lentil. And when I saw a man brooding over his gold and boasting that he had got four cups or eight rings, I laughed most heartily at him, whilst the whole Pangaeus with all its mines seemed no larger than a grain of millet. A fine sight you must have had, but how did the cities and the men look? You have often seen a crowd of ants running to and fro, in and out of their city, some turning up a bit of dung, others dragging a bean-shell, or running away with half a grain of wheat. I make no doubt but they have architects, 
demagogues, senators, musicians, and philosophers amongst them. Men, my friend, are exactly like these. If you approve not of the comparison, recollect, if you please, the ancient Thessalian fables, and you will find that Myrmidons, a most warlike nation, sprung originally from Pismires. When I had thus seen and diverted myself with everything, I shook my wings and flew off to join the sacred senate of the skies. Scarce had I gone a furlong when the moon, in a soft female voice, cried out to me, Menippus, will you carry something for me to Jupiter, so may your journey be prosperous? With all my heart, said I, if it is nothing very heavy. Only a message, replied she, a small petition to him. My patience is absolutely worn out by the philosophers who are perpetually disputing about me, who I am, of what size, how it happens that I am sometimes round and full, at others cut in half. Some say I am inhabited, others that I am only a looking-glass hanging over the sea, and a hundred conjectures of this kind. Even my light, they say, is none of my own, but stolen from the sun. Thus endeavouring to set me and my brother together by the ears, not content with abusing him, and calling him a hot stone and a mass of fire, in the meantime, I am no stranger to what these men, who look so grave and sour all day, are doing o' nights, but I see and say nothing, not thinking it decent to lay open their vile and abominable lives to the public, for when I catch them thieving or practicing any of their nocturnal tricks, I wrap myself up in a cloud that I may not expose to the world a parcel of old fellows who in spite of their long beards and professions of virtue are guilty of every vice, and yet they are always railing at me and abusing me. I swear by night I have often resolved to move farther off, to get out of reach of their busy tongues, and I beg you would tell Jupiter that I cannot possibly stay here any longer unless he will destroy these naturalists. Stop the mouths of the logicians, throw down the portico, burn the academy, and make an end of the inhabitants of Peripetus, so I may enjoy at last a little rest, which these fellows are perpetually disturbing. It shall be done, said I, and away I set out for heaven, where no tracks of beasts or signs of men are found. In little time the earth was invisible, and the moon appeared very small. And now, leaving the sun on my right hand, I flew amongst the stars, and on the third day reached my journey's end. At first I intended to fly in just as I was, thinking that being half an eagle I should not be discovered, as that bird was an old acquaintance of Jupiter's. But then it occurred to me that I might be found out by my vulture's wing, and laid hold on, deeming it therefore most prudent not to run the hazard. I went up and knocked at the door. Mercury heard me, and asking my name, went off immediately, and carried it to his master. Soon after I was let in, and trembling and quaking with fear, found all the gods sitting together, and seemingly not a little alarmed at my appearance there, expecting probably that they should soon have a number of winged mortals travelling up to them in the same manner when Jupiter, looking at me with a most severe and titanic countenance, cried out, Say who thou art, and whence thy country. Name thy parents. At this I thought I should have died with fear. I stood motionless and astonished at the awfulness and majesty of his voice. But recovering myself in a short time, I related to him everything from the beginning how desirous I was of knowing sublime truths, how I went to the philosophers, and hearing them contradict one another, and driven to despair, thought on the scheme of making me wings, with all that had happened in my journey quite up to heaven. I then delivered the message to him from the moon, at which, softening his contracted brow, he smiled at me and cried, 
what were Otis and Ephialtes in comparison of Menippus, who has thus dared to fly up to heaven? But come, we now invite you to supper with us. Tomorrow we will attend to your business and dismiss you. At these words he rose up and went to that part of heaven where everything from below could be heard most distinctly, for this, it seems, was the time appointed to hear petitions. As we went along he asked me several questions about earthly matters, such as, How much corn is there at present in Greece? Had you a hard winter last year? And did your cabbages want rain? Is any of Phidias's family alive now? What is the reason that the Athenians have left off sacrificing to me for so many years? Do they think of building up the Olympian temple again? Are the thieves taken that robbed the Dodonian? When I had answered all these, Pray, Menippus, said he, what does mankind really think of me? How should they think of you, said I, but with the utmost veneration, that you are the great sovereign of the gods? There you jest, said he. I am sure. I know well enough how fond they are of novelty, though you will not own it. There was a time, indeed, when I was held in some estimation, when I was the great physician, when I was everything in short, when streets and lanes and all was full of Jove. Pisa and Dodona were distinguished above every place, and I could not see for the smoke of sacrifices. But since Apollo has set up his oracle at Delphi, and Aesculapius practices physic at Pergamus, since temples have been erected to Bendis, at Thrace, to Anubis in Egypt, and to Diana at Ephesus. Everybody runs after them. With them they feast, to them they offer up their hecatombs, and think it honor enough for a worn-out god as I am, if they sacrifice once in six years at Olympia, whilst my altars are as cold and neglected as Plato's laws or the syllogisms of Chrysippus. With this and such like chat we passed away the time, till we came to the place where the petitions were to be heard. Here we found several holes with covers to them, and close to every one was placed a golden chair. Jupiter sat down in the first he came to, and lifting up the lid listened to the prayers, which, as you may suppose, were of various kinds. I stooped down and heard several of them myself, such as, O Jupiter, grant me a large empire. O Jupiter, may my leeks and onions flourish and increase. Grant, Jupiter, that my father may die soon. Grant I may survive my wife. Grant I may not be discovered whilst I lay wait for my brother. Grant that I may get my cause. Grant that I may be crowned at Olympia. One sailor asked for a north wind, another for a south. The husbandman prayed for rain, and the fuller for sunshine. Jupiter heard them all, but did not promise everybody. Some the just request, he heard propitious and denied the rest. Those prayers which he thought right and proper he let up through the hole, and blew the wicked and foolish ones back, that they might not rise to heaven. One petition, indeed, puzzled him a little, two men asking favors of him directly contrary to each other, at the same time, and promising the same sacrifice. He was at a loss which to oblige. He became immediately a perfect academic, and, like Pyrrho, was held in suspense between them. When he had done with the prayers, he sat down upon the next chair, over another hole, and listened to those who were swearing and making vows. When he had finished this business and destroyed Hermodorus, the Epicurean, for perjury, he removed to the next seat and gave audience to the auguries, oracles, and divinations. 
which having dispatched he proceeded to the hole that brought up the fume of the victims together with the name of the sacrificer then he gave out his orders to the winds and storms let there be rain to-day in scythia lightning in africa and snow in greece do you boreas blow in lydia and whilst notice lies still let the north wind raise the waves of the adriatic and about a thousand measures of hail be sprinkled over cappadocia when jupiter had done all his business we repaired to the feast for it was now supper-time and mercury bade me sit down by pan the corybantes Attis and Sebasius, a kind of demigods who are admitted as visitors there. Ceres served us with bread, and Bacchus with wine. Hercules handed about the flesh, Venus scattered myrtles, and Neptune brought us fish. Not to mention that I got slyly a little nectar and ambrosia, for my friend Ganymede, out of good nature, if he saw Jove looking another way, would frequently throw me in a cup or two. The greater gods, as Homer tells us, who I suppose had seen them as well as myself, never taste meat or wine, but feed upon ambrosia and get drunk with nectar. At the same time their greatest luxury is, instead of victuals, to suck in the fumes that rise from the victims and the blood of the sacrifices that are offered up to them. Whilst we were at supper, Apollo played on the harp, Silenus danced the cordex, and the muses repeated Hesiod's Theogony, and the first ode of Pindar. When these recreations were over, we all retired tolerably well soaked to bed. Now pleasing rest had sealed each mortal eye, and even immortal gods in slumber lie, all but myself. I could not help thinking of a thousand things, and particularly how it came to pass that during so long a time Apollo should never have got him a beard, and how there came to be night in heaven, though the sun is always present there, and feasting with them. I slept a little, and early in the morning Jupiter ordered the crier to summon a council of the gods, and when they were all assembled, thus addressed himself to them. The stranger who came here yesterday is the chief cause of my convening you this day. I have long wanted to talk with you concerning the philosophers, and the complaints now sent to us from the moon make it immediately necessary to take the affair into consideration. There is lately sprung up a race of men, slothful, quarrelsome, vain glorious foolish petulant gluttonous proud abusive in short what homer calls an idle burthen to the ground these dividing themselves into sects run through all the labyrinths of disputation calling themselves stoics academics epicureans peripatetics and a hundred other names still more ridiculous then wrapping themselves up in the sacred veil of virtue they contract their brows and let down their beards under a specious appearance hiding the most abandoned profligacy like one of the players on the stage if you strip him of his fine habits wrought with gold all that remains behind is a ridiculous spectacle of a little contemptible fellow hired to appear there for seven drachmas. And yet these men despise everybody, talk absurdly of the gods, and drawing in a number of credulous boys, roar to them in a tragical style about virtue, and enter into disputations that are endless and unprofitable to their disciples they cry up fortitude and temperance a contempt of riches and pleasures and when alone indulge in riot and debauchery the most intolerable of all is that though they contribute nothing towards the good and welfare of the community though they are 
unknown alike in council and in field, yet are they perpetually finding fault with, abusing, and reviling others, and he is counted the greatest amongst them who is most impudent, noisy, and malevolent. If one should say to one of these fellows who speak ill of everybody, What service are you of to the commonwealth? He would reply, if he spoke fairly and honestly, To be a sailor, or a soldier, or a husbandman, or a mechanic, I think beneath me. But I can make a noise and look dirty, wash myself in cold water, go barefoot all winter, and then, like Momus, find fault with everybody else. If any rich man sups luxuriously, I rail at and abuse him. But if any of my friends or acquaintance fall sick and want my assistance, I take no notice of them. Such, my brother gods, are the cattle which I complain of and of all these the epicureans are the worst who assert that the gods take no care of human affairs or look at all into them it is high time my brethren that we should take this matter into consideration for if once they can persuade the people to believe these things you must all starve for who will sacrifice to you when they can get nothing by it what the moon accuses you of you all heard yesterday from the stranger consult therefore amongst yourselves and determine what may best promote the happiness of mankind and our own security when jupiter had thus spoken the assembly rung with repeated cries of thunder and lightning burn consume destroy down with them into the pit to tartarus and the giants jove however once more commanding silence cried out it shall be done as you desire they and their philosophy shall perish together but at present no punishments must be inflicted for these four months to come as you all know it is a solemn feast and i have declared a truth next year in the beginning of the spring my lightning shall destroy them as to menippus first cutting off his wings that he may not come here again let mercury carry him down to the earth saying this he broke up the assembly and mercury taking me up by my right ear brought me down and left me yesterday evening in the ceramicus and now, my friend, you have heard everything I had to tell you from heaven. I must take my leave and carry this good news to the philosophers who are walking in the Poseel. End of Section 6 End of Trips to the Moon by Lucian of Samosata Translated by Thomas Franklin Recording by Ralph Snelson